Dr. Wachtel has written numerous books, including Therapeutic Communications, Principles and Effective Practice, Relational Theory and the Practice of Psychotherapy, as well as his most recent book, Cyclical Psychodynamics and the Contextual Self, The Inner World, The Intimate World, and the World of Culture and Society. Dr. Wachtel completed his undergraduate studies at Columbia University. He received his doctorate in clinical psychology at Yale University and is a graduate of the postdoctoral program in psychoanalysis and psychotherapy at New York University. He's a visiting clinical professor of psychology adjunct at the NYU postdoctoral program in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis and a distinguished professor in the doctoral program in clinical psychology at City College and the Graduate Center of the City of University of New York. From the American Psychological Association, he received the Division 39 Award for Scholarship and Research and the Division 29 Distinguished Psychologist Award. He was co-founder of the Society for the Exploration of Psychotherapy Integration. His most recent book, book and work, Cyclical Psychodynamics, Dynamics has just been published and is available in our bookstore. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Paul Wachtel. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be here, but I have to confess I feel slightly disappointed because while I was sitting here, there was this gavel sitting here for a while, and I had been looking forward to banging a gavel. I haven't done that, and it felt like fun, but I'll try to be a big boy and move on. Um, why am I here uh, is a question I really asked myself when I was first invited, um, because I'm not a group therapist. Um, why am I here is an existential and theological question, but I had a more practical uh, question about it because um, I last did group therapy many, many years ago, and I did enjoy it. In, in some way, it's a direction that I would have been logical for my career to take and that fits with the way I think, but <clears throat> I am here, you know, as a visitor, as a stranger, uh, not as an expert in group therapy. But when I was invited, I thought about why group therapy does make so much sense. Why, even at this stage in my career, maybe it's something that I should start to learn more about, pick up on the thread that I left many years ago. Uh, one of the things I was remembering was I was teaching a course in the NYU postdoctoral program just this past semester. And one of the students in the course also did group therapy as well as individual therapy. Uh, and we were talking about the, the experience of doing both. And she mentioned that sometimes when she encounters one of her individual patients in the group setting, her experience is, who is this person? That you see something when you're working with them individually, but you don't see the entirety of the person. You see how they are with you. And in the group setting, of course, you get to see how they are with a much wider range of people. And uh, as you'll see, this fits within my own model of working with individuals. I, for example, uh, not infrequently uh, will invite part of the cast of characters in people's lives into sessions with, with my patient. Again, because I feel it is so important to understand people 
in the context of their key relationships. But group therapy, of course, gives you an opportunity to really see live what individual therapists only hear about or speculate and sometimes overgeneralize about from the experience they have with the individual. I also was remembering uh, another story as I thought about the importance of group therapy uh, that I heard from a couples therapist. And the husband in this couple was verbally abusive and the therapist really had a hard time getting across to him just how offensive the way he spoke to his wife really was. And then he was talking to a close friend who knew them as a couple, and this friend said, I wouldn't tolerate it if my husband talked to me that way. And she got through to him in a way that the therapist didn't. Partly, that's a matter of role. Uh, we sometimes will respond to the therapist in, for some people, in the oppositional way they responded to a parent. They won't hear it. Sometimes it's just a matter of we hear different things from different people. Now, these are not things I really need to remind this group about. Your group therapists and you are seeing what I've just talked about all the time, but this is part of what came to mind for me as I thought, is there a place for me here? Uh, do I have a contribution to make? And is there a kind of compatibility between what I do and what you do as group therapists? Um, but I don't do group therapy. I do do couples therapy, so that's a small group, um, sometimes a difficult group, as those of you who do couples therapy know. But I do a lot of individual therapy, and the viewpoint that guides my individual therapy, which I call cyclical psychodynamics, I did think, as I reflected, was very relevant to a lot of the considerations group therapists are concerned with because compared, I think, to most psychodynamic theories, it is probably a more contextually centered understanding of individual psychodynamics. And if there's anything that group therapy would teach us, it's the importance of context the importance of how we are being shaped by those around us without our simply being a pawn to that shaping. And then I thought about, well, part of my legitimacy here, if you will, is that groups, after all, do consist of individuals. Uh, as much as Groups have their own dynamic, and I think that's true, and understanding group dynamics is crucially important. Nonetheless, groups are different from almost every other system existing in the world because the parts of groups, and this is true, of course, for families also, the parts have thoughts and feelings, and the parts of other systems don't. And that makes the in understanding the individuals in the group an obvious part of what any good group therapy has got to uh, entail. Um, I'm going to skip. This was sort of a self-justifying slide uh, that hopefully I saw a few friendly looking faces. I met a few friends before the talk. I see some smiles. So I won't force myself to do self-justification. But the but belongs there. There's always but. Um, and this is uh, what I was saying before. Effective group therapy requires attention to the experiences and the dynamics of the individuals in the group. 
because ultimately, what's the purpose of the group? Uh, unless it's a group directed toward, for example, a work group where you're trying to increase the efficiency of the group per se to um, enable the work output to be more efficient. Most of the time, the groups you work with, they have as their purpose to make the lives of the individuals in the group better. And so how we think of those individuals is crucial to how the group will work. It's not an alternative perspective to the group perspective. It is a, an essential component of it. So I want to introduce a particular view of individuals, that is the cyclical psychodynamic view, and highlight a few elements of cyclical psychodynamics and then illustrate it in, the, in, a, in a number of very brief uh, examples. Um, central to the cyclical psychodynamic view is an understanding that behavior and experience vary from context to context. This is not something that is an alternative to understanding people in depth, but rather it's a view that in order to understand people in depth, we also have to understand them in context. And that's part of why the title of my most recent book includes the phrase, the contextual self. It's not an, an inattention to the self. It's not we are just the product of our environment by any means, but that when you look at individuals in depth, you understand their deep connection to the context and you understand how each individual idiosyncratically understands, makes sense of, and transforms that context. That's a guiding assumption in my work with individuals, and I think it's a vision of deep individual dynamics that is particularly suitable for working with groups. But very important, and as part of where individual psychodynamics really matter, where they're not just a mere product of context, is that the contexts that we do encounter aren't random. Now, there's a phrase that was very common in the era of psychoanalytic ego psychology, a phrase of Heinz Hartmann's, uh, the average expectable environment. And when I was in graduate school, that phrase was a very, very important phrase in extending psychoanalysis to the world outside the psyche. But I think there is also a problem with that phrase that cyclical psychodynamics tries to address, which is that nobody lives in an average expectable environment. Uh, or if we do, we do for parts of our lives, but the problems people bring us are about the idiosyncratic features of their environment. Each of us lives in a different environment. For example, you'll hear lots of people coming up and giving talks over these next few days. And maybe even in this room, maybe even in with, with the same audience, but the moment any one of us opens our mouth, it's a different room, a different context because we start to establish a connection with you, whether positive or negative, and different for different of you. And dynamics start getting created that have never been there before. And we bring out sides of other people that may not usually come up. And understanding how we create unaverage environments, idiosyncratic environments in our lives is critical to good individual psychotherapy 
and is one of the things that the group context can really help illuminate. It's one of the things that you are seeing in front of you all the time, how each group member is creating a different environment for him or herself and bringing out different sides of the other group members. And it's a constantly changing dynamic. That's both a group phenomenon and a way of understanding individuals that's particularly powerful. Um, now, uh, one of the things that I've been especially interested in in my own understanding of working with individuals is the pervasiveness of vicious circles in the problems people bring. Uh, there is a kind of tendency in psychodynamic thought to attribute the, the problems people have to factors that are largely internal, that are the product of very early experiences, how they got assimilated and structured and cast into a particular part of the psyche and then play themselves out over and over again. That way of thinking began to be seriously challenged. It was always, there were always minority voices in psychoanalytic thought challenging that. Uh, one of the most powerful early ones um, was Harry Stack Sullivan's voice. Uh, but the interpersonal point of view was a kind of marginalized view in psychoanalysis for many years. But then with the emergence of the relational point of view, in the 1980s, that larger, larger, more contextual, more transactional view began to become more prominent. But just as analysts tell us that our early experiences limit, shape, skew the kinds of later experiences we have, the kinds of later thinking we manifest, this is true for the field as a whole as well. So there has been a phenomenon that I've called the default position that is something that even many relational analysts still in some way fall back on this internally structured, largely autonomous view of the unconscious, of the psychological structures. The structures are described by many relationalists as relational structures, so they're images of self and other, or self and other in interaction, they're internalized objects, there's a range of terms, instead of simply drives and wishes but they're still often largely described as just something stuck inside us that plays itself out, even among many, but not, certainly not all, relational thinkers. And you can detect that older stream threading through even relational thinking when you hear terms like, for example, pre which... Uh, I did a search through psychoanalytic dialogues, the most relational journal in psychoanalysis. And I did a search for the following words, pre-Oedipal, primitive, archaic, and infantile. Uh, those are all words that imply we're not responding out of a responsiveness to what is now going on but out of something old still stuck in us. And there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of articles where those words regularly appeared. Even the relational literature has that. The cyclical psychodynamic perspective in some sense is suggesting that although early experiences absolutely play a powerful role 
in shaping who we are, who we become, who we continue to be, they persist because of the kinds of new situations they create over and over. And so the patterns we see are almost never archaic or pre edible They're right up to the minute, even if they're very screwed up. Um, and that's a different way of making sense of the same observations that I think lends itself particularly well to group therapy because you are seeing the creation and recreation and re-recreation over and over of the patterns that are plaguing each of the members. And as I'll elaborate in a moment, you're seeing how each member of the group, or at least some members of the group, are drawn in to participate as accomplices in maintaining the problems of other members in the group. And I want to elaborate on this idea of accomplices uh, in, in a moment. But uh, I also want to just, you've heard a lot of words, so let's just change the pictures a little bit to try to get a different part of the brain going uh, on the same idea. So take a look at this picture. Um, you see this little old guy feeling pretty damn powerful, right? One little push and they all go tumbling down, right? It's kind of a good feeling. Do uh, you have any images of what the rest of the picture looks like? I'll let you all just imagine for yourself, and then I'll show you what it does look like. Uh, <laughs> And that's our psychological life. Uh, the things we do that feel good at the moment come back to hit us. It's, that's as, as vicious a circle as you can find. It's a very literal depiction of a vicious circle. Um, but, of course, it's uh, abstract, so let, let me try to concretize it now with a different kind of image that's more explicitly articulating the cyclical psychodynamic viewpoint. Uh, on the left, you see the arrows that are coming from or represent the internal state. That's the starting point in most psychodynamic thinking. And the cyclical psychodynamic viewpoint articulates, elaborates, the contents of those, that internal state, those conflicts, those desires, those fantasies, those thoughts, those act, action tendencies, all of that, I'm as interested in that as any psychoanalytic thinker is. But instead of seeing that as a, the kind of linear base source of the way the person lives. As this diagram illustrates, the internal state then leads to feelings and behavior in the world. I mean, after all, why are we interested in the internal state at all? It's because it affects how we are in the world, what we do, what we feel, what we convey to others, how we interact with others. So the internal state leads to actions but their actions, again, in a context, in a context where those feelings and behaviors that derive from our internal state have an impact on others, lead others to react to us in ways that, as the, it didn't, just because I, I'm not that skilled with PowerPoint, it, it's kind of not, not, doesn't look exactly like a circle, it's kind of a squashed circle. Uh, my grandchildren could probably do a better job in making it really look like a circle. Uh, but picture it as a circle. You know, it's, it's intended as a circle where the reactions of others to our behavior now feed back to recreate the internal state that starts the whole damn thing going still another time. 
That, in the abstract, is the structure of individual psychodynamics and, of course, individual psychodynamics in a context like, for example, the therapy group. To illustrate it a little more concretely, let's talk about just a couple of uh, kinds of examples. Say you have somebody who learns very early in life to be afraid of anger. Parents are either very punitive when they're angry or the parents are almost destroyed by the child being angry and step back and withdraw, or the parents just are unresponsive to it. In one way or another, the child learns, this is a part of me that I better not know about, express, feel. So that child learns to be unusually nice, kind, meek, cooperative, unassertive, etc. And from an individual, from the more traditional psychodynamic viewpoint, we could call those later behaviors, the meekness, the exaggerated niceness, the exaggerated cooperativeness, a reaction formation or some other defensive response. Um, and the earlier fear of anger is the cause and the inhibited, unassertive behavior is the effect, a kind of linear past to present. From a psychodynamic, from a cyclical psychodynamic perspective, you have to look at the rest of the circle. What happens when somebody lives that way? When somebody is not just I'm, I'm certainly, and it's more important in this era of our country than ever before, uh, I'm certainly a big fan of being kind and empathic and sensitive to the needs of others. God knows we need that today. But I'm talking about excessive, exaggerated, compulsive kindness, the kind of thing we all have encountered in certain patients who just never get their fair share. I had one patient years ago who still stays in my memory, um, a guy who, he was a college student and was somebody who had this kind of personality dynamic. Uh, by the way, Karen Horney described this kind of pattern when she talked about the moving toward uh, neurotic trend in, in some of her early writings that have extended some of these ideas. This guy was very much of that type. Uh, he had one other thing. He had this um, allergy or reaction. It was never quite clear whether it was a simple allergy or an aversion to seafood of almost all sorts. And he would, if he would eat shellfish or even fish, uh, he'd get sick. And he was a student, he was living with four or five other students in an off-campus apartment um, in order for it, the rent to be affordable for students. It was an apartment uh, that didn't have a kitchen. They would go out to local inexpensive restaurants um, for dinner each evening, and the group would try to decide, you know, where they're going to go. And if you remember back in your college days, you know, that deciding where, where, where should we go for dinner is the whole evening's activity sometimes. Um, but in this particular group, there was one guy who, as I learned more and more about it, as we reconstructed the story, wasn't an, an insensitive, overly pushy guy, but he was a healthfully, enthusiastically assertive guy who, as you might guess, happened to love seafood. Uh, so he would sort of suggest to the group as they were obsessing about where should we eat tonight, well, how about the seafood place? Uh, and the others, they were fine. Yeah, okay, let's do that. And my patient 
could never say, no, I don't like seafood, or no, I get sick when I have seafood, because that would be too assertive. It would be too insensitive to the needs of the others. It would be, quote, imposing his needs on them. You know, all kinds of, he had all sorts of rationales for for just, he couldn't do it. So four or five times a week, his pattern was he would go out with them, he would eat the seafood, he would come home and he'd be throwing up all night. Uh, that, was his, that was his life. Uh, and he saw no alternative to this. And I remember exploring with him even things like, well, you know, most seafood restaurants, they have, you know, usually something on it that says like a landlubber's menu or something where you can get chicken or a hamburger or something like that. Why, you know, could you order that? He said, oh, no, no, if I did that, that would be like saying being at a seafood restaurant isn't a good thing. It would feel too critical. So he couldn't even do that. He had to be so available to their needs that he'd actually order the seafood, which, of course, meant throwing up all night. And, you know, we had to work on that a good deal. But what's important to notice is how does living like that make you feel? Um, And I want to go back to this. The lack of assertiveness leads him, in this case, to go out and have the seafood and throw up and so on. He's making other people his oppressors. Even though they don't know they're being oppressors, they're not intending to be oppressors. It became very clear to me initially and eventually as he began, as he got better, it became objectively clear that when he said, first it was if he said, then it became when he said, as he finally did it, you know, I, I realized I, I am allergic to seafood. I get sick. Let's, let's eat somewhere else. They were absolutely fine with it. But they never knew. He, when he, even when he would go to the bathroom and throw up, it would, he would somehow find a way to do it secretly. Because, again, he did not want to, quote, offend them, hurt them, be unfair to them. So he turned them into his oppressors, his involuntary oppressors. And when you're living with oppressors, how do you feel? You feel pretty damn pissed off, right? He didn't know it. A lot of it was unconscious, but it was generating the very anger that he then had to damp down by, again, being overly cooperative, again, you know, and it wasn't just going out to seafood restaurants. He would Uh, When he had a big exam coming up, he would um, help others to study and not do so well on his exam because he had to be nice. And again, all of this put him in a situation where unconsciously the very feelings he was trying to push down got stirred up. So they weren't coming from his childhood. The whole conflict wasn't coming from his childhood, though it started in his childhood. There are a lot of words that cover over slippery thinking in our field, like talking about the roots of the problem. Yeah, the roots of the problem may have laid back very, very early, but the guts of the problem, so to speak, were happening now, over and over. The anger today was from how hard he was trying not to be angry yesterday. And the, angry, the anger he'll be struggling with tomorrow will be the result of how hard he was struggling not to be angry today. It becomes self-perpetuating. Physicists may say there's no such thing as a perpetual motion machine, but in our discipline, it's the one way we're way ahead of the physicists. We've, we see perpetual motion machines all the time. That's what a neurosis is. It's a perpetual motion machine. And those vicious circles are the structural patterns 
that cyclical psychodynamics tries to identify. And <clears throat> in those patterns, the role of accomplices is crucial. And what makes cyclical psych psychodynamics fit so well with group therapy, I think, is that you are able to watch the accomplices do their thing. And even that is not a fair way to put it. It's something that happens. But what's really important is what you're really even more importantly watching is you're watching how each person is inducing other people to be the accomplice. Just as my seafood patient induced them to be accomplices in his oppression and in the repetition of the pattern by being too passively cooperative, he draws them into something they didn't even know they were part of. <clears throat> now, there's another really important thing about the cyclical psychodynamic viewpoint. Most psychodynamic ways of thinking almost automatically attribute motivation to the behavior of whoever is behaving. Whatever we do, put it this way, whatever we do, we must have unconsciously intended to do. And sometimes when I talk to psychodynamic groups about the idea of accomplices, very quickly they slide into the idea that, without even their quite noticing, they're thinking of the malicious accomplice. The accomplice, and, and it's partly my fault, because after all, where does the word come from? It's people who are committing crimes. You know, most accomplices aren't nice guys in a certain sense. The word doesn't have that connotation. But what I'm trying to highlight is they're creating a bad effect, but not always with the intent to. They're being induced into the role, and often as these people who went out, who basically innocently went out to the seafood restaurant, they're doing it innocently. They're doing it unwittingly, but nonetheless powerfully. The, so there's an ironic quality, not always an intended quality. And that's part of why I, um, no, I'm going the wrong direction, uh, why I liked that cartoon, because it's ironic, it's unwitting. He thinks he's doing one thing, actually he's doing something else. He's having an, a, an effect he doesn't know. And the accomplices often are drawn in and part of, it's part of an ironic quality. The reason that's so important for group therapy is that when you're looking at one member of the group, somebody else is the villain of the piece in, to the degree that they are the accomplice, but that someone else is also your patient. So if you are looking at a group of all bad guys, that's not going to be good, good group therapy. Uh, if you understand that what you're looking at is how each of them are being drawn into patterns with each other that play themselves out out of awareness and often without intent, then you are able to work with these accomplice patterns without the accomplice being the bad guy. Instead, you are just seeing how people are drawn into the patterns. And if we have more time, we can look at other examples. Um, and of course, what you can do in the group, you see these patterns much more vividly than in some ways we do with individual therapy. With individual therapy, we talk about things like enactments. We look at how we ourselves as therapists can be drawn in or how we can try to transcend being drawn in. And in some ways, it's both because we will always be drawn in to some degree. But none of us is sort of the universal donor. 
uh, w- how the person is with me is not necessarily how he is with everybody else. One of the sort of overblown fallacies about the, the concept of transference, as important and valuable as it is, is it's very easy to think, well, it'll all come out in the transference. Whatever are the important patterns in the person's life eventually will be manifested with me. And I don't know, maybe I just am unusually blind, but it seems to me after many, many years of practice that a lot of times I hear about stuff that goes on between my patient and other people and it doesn't happen with me. And I hear and I see things happening with me that are problematic that don't happen with other people. We are unique each pair. We are contextually responsive again. So it doesn't all happen with the one other person. So if, as in doing individual therapy, I have to do a lot of listening for the patterns in the person's daily life because I can't assume it will all come out with me. I have to be watching what's happening and experiencing what's happening with me, but I have to also look at what's happening in the person's daily life. And as I alluded to earlier, I will sometimes invite in members of the cast of characters so I can see who the other people in the context are. But God, you you guys, you get to see much more of it when you're working with groups. And... So I'm feeling, again, that regret of my, you know, career choice many, many years ago. Not all of it. I like what I do. Uh, and none of us can be infinite. You know, we make our choices. It also would have been nice to discover the cure for cancer. I didn't have a chance to do that or to hit 90 home runs. I mean, there's a lot of things I didn't get to do. Or I wouldn't have been able to do, of course. Um, but... Group therapy certainly feels like it fits hand in glove with this way of thinking psychodynamically. I'm going to stop very shortly because I I do want to leave a little time for questions. But I want to highlight one other thing, which is uh, because so much there's been so much thought about and written about attachment um, recently, and I want to just illustrate. some of the subtleties of how the attachment relationship is part of what generates uh, these kinds of patterns. And uh, because I think just that, that it's so easy to think that when we become afraid of or alienated from or uh, not in touch with an important part of ourselves, which is kind of what the heart of almost all psychological difficulty entails in one way or another, that this must be because we got punished for it. And sometimes we can't see that so readily, and we're just speculating. And I think sometimes it's not that, a lot of times. Uh, And one case in particular really highlighted that for me. Um, And it illustrates also the bringing other people into uh, how it's so important to have other perspectives. Uh, A a woman I was seeing many years ago um, was perhaps the most securely attached person I've ever worked with in some way. She had a remarkably good, warm, open relationship with both of her parents, Uh, not just good in the sense of nice and loving, but really they could talk things through, they could address difficulties and come go beyond them. Uh, She had a similarly good relationship with her husband and with her children. Um, She was in many ways somebody uh, whose mental health was way beyond my own. Um, And so what was she doing there? 
Uh, she was there because the one symptom that brought her into therapy was she was uh, she had great difficulty in being sexually responsive to her husband. And we explored this in all sorts of ways. And, you know, the, the easy sort of wise-ass understanding that we therapists, you know, almost always have as well, somewhere or other it reflects some deep problem in the relationship that's just not being acknowledged. As best I could tell, it did not. The, the relationship was really admirable. But this was there, and it was a source of tension in itself, but it, it was remarkable how well they even dealt with it. And I wasn't, wasn't really getting a good sense of how this might have arisen for her and what it was about uh, until at a certain point, her, she had an older brother who she was also quite close to. Uh, he was 15 or 16 years older, uh, now they were adults. They they related to each other as you know as just as peers as two adults. But he was much older. And he lived in California, and he was going to be in New York for a weekend. And she asked me, you know, might there be some value in his coming in to see if he had any ideas about this, since he had been around the home, you know, when she was growing up, um, and. They, she discussed it. She discussed it with her husband, how much she, he was comfortable with her sharing with him what the problem was. They worked that through. She, they wanted to do it. So her brother came in, and we began the session, and I, after just trying to get to know him a little bit, started to you know, ask him about, this, did he have any thoughts at all about how this problem you know, where it might have come from. I said, you know, we really both are very puzzled. I don't, we don't see anything in, in the family that uh, might account for it. And this seemingly lovely guy hearing about a, something terribly distressing his sister was experiencing just started to laugh. And we both were at first taken aback. You know, this was, why was he laughing? You know, we're talking about a serious problem here. And then it became clear that it was a warm, wonderful laugh, a laugh of rec recollection. He was remembering something from when my patient was around a year old, you know, give or take some, you know, the age when mothers are teaching children the parts of the body as the kid is first learning to speak. And he was able to observe that he was by then 16 years old. So he was, you know, able to watch this. Uh, and it, he had ne they had never talked about it, but it had stayed in his memory all those years because it was so striking to him. And f at that time, funny, because he didn't know what its consequences would be. What he remembered was his mother teaching this little girl the parts of the body this is your eye, this is your nose, this is your mouth, this is your chin, this is your neck, this is your chest, this is your belly, those are your knees. Uh, and it, you know, especially a 16-year-old, uh, you know, very much attuned to the part of the body that's being left out. Uh, it really struck him. And we, you know, the patient and I, you know, our mouths were open, and suddenly we understood something. Because the mother, because even in the best of attachments, attachment involves attunement to the other, and there is nobody who is equally attuned to every single feature of their child. It, you can't be. They're, the very interest in this, at, the, at least at the moment, is a disinterest in that. The interest in this is a lesser interest in that. We are all partially attuned. But with this girl, the attunement was such that something got left out. And so much else was wonderful that she kind of learned to orient her life around 
everything else about her except that omitted part. And as we thought about it and talked about it later, she remembered things like the, the, the way the family would, when they would go to a movie uh, together, and uh, if there was something sexy in the movie, uh, she suddenly was sort of seeing what she had seen but not registered, that mother would always somehow change the subject as they were talking about that. Did you, did you see the dress she was wearing? Or uh, would anybody like, you know, a snack? Or, you know, she would change the subject. That all sorts of ways that part of life was being left out. And so that's another important part of how these patterns get developed. Uh, there's more in this because, you know, compulsively I'm always worried I won't have enough to say, so I put in more. I'm going to um, skip to the very last thing. Uh, you may wonder why this. What, have I really gone off the deep end now? I want to highlight, because another part of this overall point of view, and it's what the therapeutic communication book is about, is so much is not just how we think, but how we say things, how we communicate to the patient. And I've been, that's been a central concern of mine for years. So I'm, I'm a big writer of Amtrak. And in the bathrooms in Amtrak, you see this sign in the bathrooms. And, you know, I realized that, you know, in some way, like many of us who have advanced degrees, I'm a little bit over-socialized, you know, so I, uh, the sign says, um, except when train is standing in station, but my flushing behavior is so automatic that, you know, I often would flush and then notice the sign. You know, it's sort of like there are certain behaviors that when they're deeply ingrained, we just run through them. Um, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll do one second. Um, we just run through them. It's like the behaviors people come to with problems. One time I saw a different sign. Please do not flush toilets when train is standing in station. Train crews are working under the car. Uh, I have never again flushed the toilet when we were in a station, because how you say it matters. Um, so I just want to end by letting you know about one other organization that represents the kind of integrative thinking that we're talking about here. Uh, it's called CEPI. It's uh, cepiweb.org. If you want to find out more about this way of thinking about things, this is a good place to find out. So thank you. I've been informed that I went a little too far and there's no time for questions. I apologize. <laughs>